This is the You Can Learn Chinese podcast for everyone who's trying to learn Chinese or reaching for the next level. You came to the right place. I am your host, Jared Turner, longtime resident of China, co-founder of the Mandarin Companion Graded Reader Series, Chinese blogger, and is still trying to figure out who stole cookies from the cookie jar. My co-host is John Paston, co-founder of Mandarin Companion, founder of All Set Learning, the Chinese Grammar Wiki, Sinosplice.com, and eats only dolphin-safe tuna. In this episode, John and I discuss one of the greatest controversies in learning Chinese: the struggle between simplified and traditional characters. You'll learn how all of this started, and by the end, know enough to answer the question: Which one should I learn? Guest interview is with Phil Crimmins, who co-founded Mandarin Blueprint. While pursuing a career as a professional drummer in China, he went on to develop some serious Chinese skills, and he shares with us his method that helped him master Chinese characters. All this and more. Let's get to it. Hey, John. Hey, Jared. How you doing, man? Pretty good. Ready to talk about a somewhat controversial topic today? Oh yes, let's talk about it. This one's gonna stir some controversy for sure. Okay, but before we start ruffling feathers, why don't we take a look at what people are saying about our podcast? Okay, sure thing. We got a couple reviews here to read. Our first review from Sima Tianmu. He comes from America. Here, he wrote us a review. Says, "Welcome back to podcasting, John. Great to meet you, Jared. Love the Manor Companion series. I own them all, and I can't wait for more." Great conversations on the podcast. More and more people are learning Chinese. It makes sense that we hit pause once in a while to evaluate how things are going and see if things can possibly be improved. I like the format of having a conversation about what's on your mind about learning and teaching Chinese, followed by an interview with people with interesting experiences learning Chinese. Often, those two things reinforce or relate each other. Anyway, keep up the good work. Thanks, Sima Tianmu. Thank you. Glad you're、uh, you're enjoying the podcast and that you've heard me before on Chinese Pod. That's pretty cool. Okay, so、um, another one by Alex Joseph. Thank you, Jared and John. This podcast is a godsend for me, arriving in my first year of studying Chinese. I learn best with a heavy dose of theory, something that's been lacking from my language classes. I've been longing for a resource that'll help me build a framework for my growing vocabulary. And lo, here it is. To be clear, this podcast isn't going to teach you Chinese, but it is going to teach you how to learn Chinese, or at least that's the idea. Four episodes in. There's a thousand apps and books for cramming characters and phrases, but a distinct lack of ways to bring it all together. You can learn Chinese looks like a very promising and entertaining attempt to fill that gap. So this review is a bit older, right? How many podcasts are we up to now, Jared? Well, this is number eighteen, John. Ooh, I'm losing track too. Yeah, a bit more than four. Okay, John. So we have this controversial topic. It's bound to arouse very、um, opinionated views among certain. Subsets of the Chinese population, and what is that topic? Memes, not memes, John. <laughs> okay, but it came up this time because of a meme you made, right? Oh, that's right, that's right. Okay, so this meme I created and posted on Instagram, Facebook, and、I、actually put this on Reddit too. The meme template is the blinking white guy. It's the Drew Scanlon reaction. So it's the guy kind of like、uh, looking blinking, like、uh, what? Excuse me. The meme says nostalgic person. I wish we could go back to the good old days, and the response is, "Every person studying simplified characters." And the Drew Scanlon, he's like,、uh, "Excuse me, this is、uh, anyone who's like、uh, in the old days. The only thing that we had was traditional characters. So the implication is that if we had to go back to the good old days, everyone learning simplified characters right now would have to go back and learn traditional characters." And there was quite a period when Americans started learning Chinese back in the good old days, when anyone who was studying Chinese was probably bound for Taiwan. And most of the Chinese teachers in the U.S. were from Taiwan, so of course there was a heavy emphasis on traditional characters, which are still used exclusively, pretty much in Taiwan. But in recent years, things have changed quite a bit.、Uh, in the U.S., it's mostly mainland Chinese、uh, immigrants, and in Chinese programs as well, Chinese teachers are mostly from mainland China. So what's being taught more and more are simplified Chinese characters, which are used in mainland China. And I think John, it's important for people to understand a little bit of the history behind this. Like, where did we get these two systems from? Why does one part of the Mandarin-speaking world use simplified characters, and why does another part use traditional characters? And what is this debate all about? Okay, so unfortunately, this is kind of rooted in politics because when the Chinese Communist Party came to power, you know, they had a lot of work cut out for them, helping China heal after a very divisive civil war. 
And uh, one of the things that they wanted to do was tackle literacy. And they were convinced that one way to help the entire population learn to read at a higher level was to uh, simplify the Chinese language. So this is not the first time Chinese has ever been standardized, but it is definitely the big one in recent history. Now, John, you are our linguist, Chinese linguist in residence. So give us just a little bit more history of Chinese characters, where they came from, how we even got them today, how we get this whole system. Okay, so Chinese characters started out long ago with uh, oracle bone characters, and they evolved over time, taking on different pictographic shapes, and then later on adding components that referred to meaning. Uh, They became more abstract, they incorporated more and more phonetic elements, and they just kept changing and changing. And they've been standardized over the years, largely through emperors' attempts to unify the way that different parts of China write in Chinese. And as the characters became more and more widespread, it was more and more important for them to be unified. And so we've had several reforms in characters over the years. One of the most significant ones was when Qin Shi Huang, uh, the Qin Dynasty, he made some sweeping changes. And then later on, we had another one, which is why we call them Han Zi, because during the Han Dynasty, there was a major reform of the characters. So um, we have had quite a few changes to the characters over time. We have a lot more characters than we used to, but we've also lost a lot of characters because one of the things that the emperors did when they standardized the characters was they purged a bunch of like ones that weren't really widespread or weren't really necessary. So John, what you talked about, the purging of characters, some numbers I have seen say that Chinese has something like, you know, 60,000 characters, but a lot of those characters you would, you could say are quote unquote purged, right? Well, I mean, there's purging and there's purging. Like uh, Qin Shi Huang, the, the original emperor, he burned a bunch of books. That was some serious purging. But there's the Kangxi Dictionary, which was an early standardization of the system. And that included a ton of characters, which were never officially purged, but they're not in common usage. So one of the things you see nowadays is governments like uh, Japan, China, they will standardize which characters are allowed to be used in print, or which characters are taught in schools and which characters should not be used in schools, that kind of thing. So it's not so much a purge as it is a standardization and a discouraging of using certain obscure forms. So, but nowadays, I think the numbers I've seen, John, are like 99% of all the characters used in Chinese consist of about, you know, 3,000 characters. And there's a long tail on that 1%. Yeah, that's right. Today, you don't need to know these tens of thousands of characters to be, you know, literate or fluent in Chinese. All right, here's another number that you might find useful. There's a a character set for typing in Chinese on a computer. And the original one that was implemented was devised in 1980, but it was the one that a lot of people used, you know, in the early days of the internet. It had 6,763 characters. It was called GB2312. So 6,763, you could write pretty much anything you wanted to on a Chinese language forum uh, in mainland China. Oh, that's really interesting. So I guess if we go back to pre-simplification period, there was no simplified and traditional characters. It just was Chinese characters, right? Yeah, so what we think of as traditional now is just the original form of characters prior to the 1950s when the communists started uh, simplifying them. Now, how did they approach the simplification process? All right, that's a really good question. And I feel like it's something that is often not uh, neutrally discussed because uh, if you talk to some people, they'll have you believe that it was a bunch of crazed butchers just removing beautiful components and replacing them with nonsense and giving us this horrible Frankenstein's monster mishmash of characters. So it's not that bad. And actually, if you think about given the task of simplifying Chinese characters, how would you do it? You know you have to simplify them, whether or not you think it's a good idea. That's your job. You're a conscientious linguist. How would you simplify the characters? What they actually did is quite sensible. So one of the things they did is they looked at some of the really complicated characters that people hate writing, and they looked at, well, how are they actually writing it shorthand? Because, you know, Chinese people, they take shortcuts. They don't want to write those characters with 50 strokes. So they take shortcuts. So they took some of those. And they made them into the official forms, you know, so they would have a print form. Some of those also came from, rather than just, you know, people's shortcuts, they came from calligraphy styles. So a lot of calligraphy styles for aesthetics, for style, they would simplify characters. Um, I remember when I first started studying Simplified, 
and I saw the character for Che Car and Dong East and uh, Shu meaning book. They, they just look so crazy, and I felt like they were inconsistent because I originally started learning Japanese, and then when I started learning Chinese, I started with traditional, which was mostly in line with what I'd learned in Japanese. And when I saw these, I was just like, what the heck? These look really different. But it turns out those come from the grass script calligraphy style. So they didn't just make them up. They're not just like, oh, let's just ask your four-year-old how we should write it. And whatever he scratches down on a piece of paper, we'll just use. It's not like that. On that note, a couple characters that listeners may know, for example, like ji, like ji ge, like, you know, like how many, the ji, that is a two-stroke character, but that used to be a 12-stroke character. So, I mean, there's, I think there's some good examples, like even like ge, like ge ge, or, you know, ji ge. That one originally was a 10-stroke character, and now it's down to three strokes. So, I mean, yeah, th- those are things we write very commonly or would be written very commonly, but now it's much easier to write. Right. So it's logical, right? One of the big criticisms of simplified characters is that you had this system that has components, you know, in the character structure, some for representing meaning, some for representing sound. And uh, what people really hate to see is when a component of a character that represented meaning was taken out because it was somewhat complex and it was replaced with something that uh, is simpler but doesn't really have meaning. And so, yeah, there are examples of that in simplified characters, and I can understand that point of view. It, that does happen. But by the same token, another thing that happens is you have some components of complex traditional characters taken out and replaced with something that's simpler, but also has a little bit of aid in how to pronounce it. So it's not only like a one-way trend where you're taking out meaning or you're taking out help for pronunciation. There are cases where meaning or sound were subbed back in, but in a simpler to write way. Now, this goes to a common argument that I might hear from a Taiwanese or uh, another person who grew up using traditional characters. And I'm sure you, you've heard some of these, John. For example, I had a friend, she was Taiwanese. And what she said about her kids learning Chinese is that she was insistent that they learn traditional characters first, and then it was okay for them to learn simplified. And her rationale was that, you know, the traditional characters have so much more meaning and so much deeper heritage. And if they were to only learn simplified characters, they lose so much of that. So to her, that was like really important. And I've heard that perspective a lot from uh, Taiwanese people or others who use traditional characters. And what would you think about that, John? Well, see, this is where it becomes a very subjective thing, right? For the Taiwanese, you know, they're still using traditional characters. So yeah, of course, study traditional characters. If you have a connection to Taiwan, it makes sense. Uh, I'm an applied linguist. I believe in applying the language. I believe that language is a tool and we should use it in a way that makes sense. So, you know, a, a shovel is a tool. Do you want to use a beautiful shovel or do you want to use a shovel that works really well in the place that you want to hold? So I know people don't like to think of language that way. It's a part of our culture. Um, it can be beautiful. It can be art. Sure. But um, I start from kind of this practical perspective. So another aspect, if you're not Taiwanese, you can look at the history. You know, Chinese characters have always been changing. Emperors have done massive simplification projects, standardization projects. Sure, it was a long time ago, but it's not like there's one continuous unbroken line of beautifully organically evolving characters and suddenly it was struck down. You know, it's it's an emotional thing. I understand why people don't like the simplifications, but as someone who's not quite as close to the issue and as someone who lives in mainland China, I'm not so upset by it as um, I can understand how some people might be. And for our listeners, part of it is the, the political issue. We touched on that a little bit. But for example, like in Taiwan, it's actually illegal to use simplified characters on official documents. So by law, they need to use traditional characters or in their terms, real characters on all of their documents. And that's consequently what's taught in schools and so forth. Well, in mainland China, too, there are standards and publishing and you have to publish in simplified characters. Everyone has to. Now, you're allowed to use traditional characters for company logos, you know, art. Of course, calligraphy is still in traditional because, you know, that's part of the tradition. But you can't just publish a book and traditional characters for the masses in mainland China either. 
And I think that's an interesting thing to note that in China, there are still a lot of traditional characters used. And you touched on that, for example, like company names. Like I never studied traditional characters, but characters I always see on signs or in company names or stuff is like like long, like dragon, frequently going to see that traditional character. Same with like guo, like zhongguo, that character you'll see, you know, that traditional. So there are there are a lot of characters like that you'll see. Yeah, like Bank of China, right? The Bank of China logo uses calligraphy and it's in traditional characters. So it's not like they're trying to erase the existence of traditional characters from people's minds, but they are committed to standardizing like regular printed books in simplified characters. Now, something else you hear from the China perspective is by the simplification of characters, they've been able to boost literacy rates all over China. And why that's true that since they've introduced simplified characters, literacy rates have you know dramatically increased in China. And I don't know the exact figure, but it, it's high. It's, it's probably in the 80s or 90s percent. But the counter argument is that in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, where they use traditional characters, literacy rates are actually higher than they are in China. And in mainland China, you could attribute the increase in literacy rates to just the increase in access to education. And the, the, the Chinese government has actually done very well at that, at providing education to the masses. You know, it's not necessarily an argument that the statistics prove, per se, but anecdotally, people can say that, hey, it is a little bit easier to learn simplified characters because, you know, there's less strokes that maybe in some instances it's a little less confusing. And there are some simplified characters which look much more different than their traditional counterparts. Anyway, you can look at some of the comparisons and some of the arguments, you know, there's for and against, but I don't think it's really conclusive per se. A lot of those arguments are, you know, emotional and political. Yeah, and I think it's fair to say that for the improving literacy in mainland China and the simplification of the character system, there's correlation, but it's not definitely causation at all. And I, I think one other interesting thing is when people first started using the internet and they didn't have high resolution screens, it was actually really hard to read traditional characters on a, on a crappy monitor with low resolution because the characters were so dense and complex, right? But that is an issue that has gone away as our screen resolution improves. You know, even on a tiny screen on a mobile phone, you, you can easily read the traditional characters. And uh, since we're not writing by hand nearly as much as we used to be, um, it's really less of an issue whether you're using traditional or simplified. For me, it's all about the practicality of what are you going to do with your Chinese? Are you going to go to Taiwan? Are you going to go to mainland China? Uh, that's what you need to be asking. So, John, let's boil this down to what is your recommendation? If someone comes to you and says, should I learn simplified or traditional characters? What do you say? By default, if you don't know, learn simplified because it is by far what most people you encounter will be using unless you have plans to go to Taiwan. Um, I also do not recommend trying to learn both of them in the beginning. It's not that hard to learn the other once you have a good grasp on one, but don't do them at the same time from the beginning. It's not the most effective way to do it. And I'd also like to note here that a lot of mainland Chinese people are actually quite fluent in both. They can read traditional characters, makes them a little bit tired. The funny thing is a lot of Mainland Chinese people can read traditional characters because of all their experience reading movie subtitles when the movies come from Taiwan and Hong Kong or reading song lyrics and karaoke because a lot of the pop music comes from Hong Kong and Taiwan. What do you think, Jared? What's your experience with these? From my experience at Manor Campaign, I'm just going to throw some hard numbers out there. We sell both simplified and traditional versions of our books. And I look at the actual sales data 89% of our sales are in simplified. And so once again, I back you up, John, is that if you don't know which one you're going to study or which one you want to actually learn, learn simplified because that is the most widely used. If you plan on going to Taiwan, living there, uh, or something else like that, or you are going to be around Taiwanese people or whatever that is, if you're around the people that are using traditional all the time, go ahead and learn traditional. I personally do think it is a little bit easier to learn simplified, but I think they're both okay. Obviously, yeah, I'm a little more biased to that simplified because that's what I learn. Once again, in my experience and working with many different Taiwanese people in Shanghai, that they all can read simplified. Yeah, I have learned a lot of traditional while I'm at it, but I'm not as proficient. Sometimes when a 
Taiwanese person messages me on WeChat and it's in traditional, I'm like, oh, sometimes I have to pull up my Playco because there's some characters I don't know. And I got to say, I've got a lot of experience with all different kinds of learners and pretty much everyone likes whatever they learn first and they think it's easier. So it's just totally subjective. All right, now it's a word from our sponsor and our sponsor today is Mandarin Companion. All right, so today we're going to talk about one of our new breakthrough level books. It's 150 characters uh, that you'll need to be able to read this book. And the book is called Hua Ma. Literally, that means flower horse. English title is In Search of Hua Ma. Okay, so this is a, a book about a boy who uh, is in the mountains of Shanxi, and he's looking for some flowers for his mom's birthday. But um, something strange happens. He ends up transported across China to a somewhat surreal, a uh, little bit like Alice in Wonderland, place in another part of China. And he's on a quest to find Hua Ma in order to get back home. I got to say, John, this is definitely my favorite story thus far in our breakthrough series. I really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with this one. There's a great play on the words when they find the, you know, the workers in there, you know, that's Nishanita Ma Ma Ma. You know, anyway, so there's a lot of Ma's and stuff. I think it's going to be pretty funny. I, I really enjoy this story. Yeah, it's probably one of the few fantasy stories we have. We're trying to hit different genres. You know, we've done a little bit of sci-fi, but this one is kind of Alice in Wonderland style fantasy. So it's not out yet. It's going to be released in about two weeks. So keep your eyes open for it. You can also visit our website at mannercompanion.com. You're welcome to join our mailing list so that when it comes out, you'll be among the first to know. Okay, now we have rants and raves. John, what do you have for us? You got a rant or a rave? I've got a rave. I hope I haven't said this before because I can't keep track of what I've said, but it's a book and it relates to our discussion from before. And I first read this book way back in 1998 when I was studying Japanese in Japan. It's a classic. Um, it's by John DeFrancis, and the name of the book is Chinese Language Fact and Fantasy. John DeFrancis is a very famous uh, Western linguist specializing in Chinese studies. He wrote this book because he realized there are a lot of misconceptions about the Chinese language, uh, especially back when he wrote it in 1984. It still holds true today. Uh, lots more people are, are learning the language. But there are a lot of myths surrounding it, sometimes held by uh, non-Chinese, and sometimes held by Chinese themselves. So it's good to see a linguist's perspective on this issue of Chinese characters. Well, sounds fascinating, John. Was that sincere, Jared? Semi-sincere. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. <laughs> okay, I also have a rave. I heard about this from uh, a friend. She told me about this YouTube video called The Pinyin Pirates. It's been around for a while. I think it was published in 2008. So it's been around like 11 years. And I checked it out and it is super quirky. I mean, it is like cheesy, corny, terribly. But <laughs> it's got some great explanation on how to pronounce Z-H, C-H, S-H, and R in Chinese. And so they have this shtick they do, and he's got the pinging pirate and ah, how to do your R's and, uh, but it's not you know the, it's not the R like you know English R. It's the <laughs> which is kind of more of the Chinese and the, you know and sh and ch and all that stuff. Anyway, so it's if you're having trouble with those sounds, just go to YouTube and search pinging pirate. And you'll find the video right there. And it's, it's just a couple minutes long, but it's, it's, it's a good, it's a fun little uh, view and it should help your pronunciation out a bit. Cool. And I also have some more information on pronunciation on Sinosplice.com and uh, Chinese Pronunciation Wiki if you need more help. But uh, check out the pirate tips first. Arr. Well, do you have pirate tips, Johnny? I do actually have a pirate connection on the, uh, the Chinese Pronunciation Wiki. Oh, you have a, a pirate connection. What be your pirate connection there? Check it out. All right, I'll do it. All right, so now we have an interview. Jared's going to do the entire interview in a pirate voice. I'll run you through, you landlubber. I'm uh, here in Chengdu. It's a very rainy day. That's Phil Crimmins. I uh, am from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Phil moved to China in 2011. 
and he found that he had a unique skill that was in demand. When I was younger, I played drums, and I studied drums at Temple University, jazz performance. And then after I moved to China, I ended up playing drums a lot around here. Up until that point, he hadn't bothered to learn much Chinese, so he decided to get serious about it and enrolled in a Chinese program at Sichuan University. I got a degree in Chinese language. In 2016, I started Mandarin Blueprint with、uh, my partner Luke Neal. Phil's going to tell us all about this in his interview. As you listen to his story, you may discover that you are doing some of the things he did to learn Chinese. What I like about Phil's story is that he has since discovered better ways to learn Chinese and shares those with you. Stay with us. Well, I'm, I'm interested in first understanding why did you start learning Chinese? First of all, I did not have a particular interest in China. I grew up with a、uh, map of the world on my bedroom wall, and so. You know, China sticks out because it's such a big country. But I didn't have any particular interest in martial arts or, you know, something that would make me go, "Oh yeah, yeah, I particularly like China." But what happened was, I ended up coming to China for an economic reason. In、uh, 2010, I had a couple of friends who moved to Beijing for a year, and I just sort of assumed it was going to be one of those, "Oh, we're moving to Beijing because we want to like have a." A year where we do something fun and we find ourselves, and then we go and then we come back. You know the standard plan after college, go for a year type of thing, right? But then halfway through, I was on a Skype call with one of them, and he was like, "Oh, I'm staying," and I was so shocked at the time. I was like, <laughs> "What? You're going to stay in China? Why?" Like I just didn't even consider that it might be a nice place to live. So I kind of started. Grilling him a little bit because I was like surprised by that decision, and he explained he was like, "Well, you know, here I can work about twenty five hours a week, easily make enough to live. The worst job I'll ever have is being an English teacher." And、uh, he was like, "Think about the worst job you would have in the states." And I was like, "Yeah." And so <laughs> I started thinking about it, and I had this、uh, roommate at the time who had lived in Japan for six years, and I had a bunch of sort of misconceptions about. China and Japan at that time, in the sense that a lot of the stuff that he was telling me about Japan, I assumed was also true of China, and I just mapped this onto China in my mind because you know, average uneducated American about the Far East, right? I discovered in that Skype call with my friend who was in Beijing that the demand for English teachers is so high that they're not going to say you have to have a degree in you know education or whatever to get a kindergarten teaching job or something. And at the time, I wasn't really happy with my job in the states. I was selling drums, and so I was like,、oh, "What am I going to do? Maybe I'll just go try this out." And so I went to Beijing for really just because I was at a crossroads in life, and、uh, I had a friend who suggested it. And I thought, "All right, I'm going to go, and I'm not going to give myself a time limit. I'm just going to see how I feel about it." And for the first two years, I lived in Beijing. That was basically, you could say, that was my time of figuring out whether or not I wanted to stay in China. And by 2013, I had made that decision, and that's when I really started studying Chinese in earnest. And it was really just because here I am, you know, I've decided I'm staying, so better learn the language. So that was the first motivation.、Uh, and also, you know, I thought I've gotten jobs as an English teacher, and then eventually I transitioned into being a professional drummer. And which was a real delight to find out, by the way. Like you know, in Philadelphia, the competition is way too intense to be able to make a living. But in Beijing, I was able to make a living, and that's actually what brought me to Chengdu in the first place. Was a job here, a job playing drums at a at a nightclub, and it was Chengdu that really made me fall in love with, you know, China. But specifically Sichuan and Chengdu, it's a really awesome city, and so. I、uh, decided I was going to stay, and I went. Okay, if I'm going to stay, I need to get better at Chinese. I knew some Chinese, I knew some characters, didn't really know much at all, and so I decided, all right, I'm going to stay here. It'll be good for my life. It'll be good for my career prospects. And I just kind of made a decision. I was like, you got to get good at something. You know, I'm decent at drums, but I, I got to get good at something else. So I decided to、um, to really study in earnest, and that was late 2013. So there was kind of this confluence of economic opportunity, jobs, right, and then also you could be a professional drummer there. That that's really cool. 
Oh, yeah. Real quick, I'm interested in that. Like, how did you get into that, like, professional drumming? I mean, obviously, you're a drummer, but where did you find that opportunity? Yeah, so it was just I went to a um, a jam session at a place called VA Bar in Beijing. And they have a jam session. And actually, I meet a guy named Sam Silverman, who's one of the co-founders of Tudor Mandarin, which I found out way later. But he's a bass player, and he was running the jam. He's from Boston area, went to Villanova, which is in the Philadelphia area. We quickly connected and we're like, oh, cool. You know, we're from the same area. And then I sat down and jammed. And then after the jam, so many people came up to me and they were like, hey, we didn't know you were in town. And I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't. I'd already been in Beijing for six months. I just didn't know about any jam sessions or anything. They were just like, well, you know, we get gigs a lot. You want to, you know, exchange contact information. I think it was a little bit pre WeChat. Yeah, the rest is history. I just got a few contacts. And then next thing you know, and it was such a discovery for me. I was like, wow, I can't believe that I can actually make a living playing drums. And I slowly weaned off of English teaching and added more drumming gigs. Uh, so that was a, a very welcome surprise. A, a jingxi. That's kind of interesting. We, one of our uh, guests we had before in episode A was Dr. David Moser, and he's kind of a, a legend in Chinese education and research. But yeah, he's also into jazz. And so he, he was able to get into the jazz scene in Beijing. And that was in, I think, in the 90s. I think that's for our listeners to know that, you know, sometimes you have like a niche skill. There's also opportunities for those here in China. 100%. If you get your Chinese up to snuff, there's a big chance that you'll be able to apply whatever your skill is in China. So your drumming took you to Sichuan, and now you said, hey, I'm really going to learn Chinese in earnest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, at that point, did you say like, hey, I think I really want to stick around in China? Is that was kind of a motivation to learn? Yeah, that was the thing that made me go, all right, that's my initial motivation is that I've decided to stay. I got to at least get the basics down. And I had some other things that I said to myself like, oh, it'll be good for your career and stuff. But it wasn't until I was partway through studying that my motivation shifted. And what was that? Yeah, it was getting into conversations with Chengdu people and, and people from this area. Because, you know, I don't, uh, I don't know if your listeners know this, but Chengdu is, is 45 minutes approximately, or like even a half hour bullet train now to Qingchengshan, which is the birthplace of Taoism. So you got to figure, even though it's not like everybody here is a Taoist or anything, you got to figure the Taoist sort of philosophies and mindsets have influenced this region for literally millennia. The people here have a subculture for sure. They definitely consider themselves Chinese. They're proud to be Chinese. But unlike a lot of places I've gone to in China where it feels like the only difference is the dialect and the food, otherwise it's the same, Chengdu has a very distinct, and I would say Sichuan in general, has a very distinct subculture that's very much about tolerance. It's about being very qing, so like welcoming and warm-hearted. And I was like, I need to know how these people are thinking about the world because they're so awesome that my motivation shifted to being about Chengdu people and wanting to understand more uh, about them. And that's like, that's a lifelong journey that I'm still on. And then once that was the motivation, uh, there was never going to be anything stopping me at that point. So it was that desire for connection to the local people. And a curiosity. So where did that take you then? So you, you started feeling that or you wanted, you desired that connection. Now, what, what did you do in order to really gain that proficiency that you wanted in Chinese? In 2013, I finished up a contract gig working at the Kempinski Hotel playing drums. And I had saved up some money and I had decided that what I was going to do was enroll in Sichuan University and it wasn't because I thought that Sichuan University was going to teach me Chinese. I was aware that university curriculums have a number of, uh, I mean, I don't want to rag on university curriculums, but challenges. <laughs> it's not exactly the best way to learn Chinese, if you, but I had other techniques in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And so, but I thought, all right, I'm going to do this anyway. So if I go to a university, I can get a visa. I can also at least make Chinese a priority first thing in the morning, five days a week. Mm -hmm. And so I started studying there. But the whole time, though, I was taking the curriculum, the actual content of the textbooks and what was being talked about in class and putting it into my own system. And another thing that I did before I even started was, uh, yeah, this is actually an important point. So when I decided that I wanted to stay, I was still working at the Kempinski. And I had realized, okay, if I'm going to stay and I'm going to learn Chinese, I need to keep learning characters because 
that was the advice that my friend who lived in Japan told me. And of course, you know, Japanese and Chinese are different, but he said, don't be illiterate, like learn the, the characters of the language. It'll help you so much. And I was very lucky in that advice. So he recommended the book, Remembering the Kanji, which is, of course, Remembering the Simplified Hanza is what I ended up using by James Heisig. And I took part one and part two, the 3000 characters that those books cover very seriously. I was like that, I'm going to get this down. And I got the first 1500 finished before I entered the semester, the first semester. And then by the end of that semester, I got the other 1500 finished because I started applying new techniques to it that made it go faster. I'm interested in hearing about this. So that is a serious grind <laughs> to get him 1500 mm -hmm. characters. How long did it take you to recognize that many? It really is in two parts because actually Heisig's second part, uh, remembering the simplified Hansa part two, didn't come out uh, until late 2013, maybe, or, or maybe it was early 2013. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I remember there was a period of time between finishing the first book and the second book coming out for me. Mm -hmm. And so the first book, I did it as Heisig recommends it. So basically come up with a mnemonic device to remember the character components and the meaning. But his theory was you can't also add in the pronunciation because that's too many things. Mm -hmm. Like it's too many things to try to remember mnemonically speaking. But at that point, is that how you applied it the first time? Yeah. So that's how I applied it the first time. And then I, what I did after that to learn the pronunciation. Okay, but before you get into that, how effective was that for you? And then mm. what were you able to do with the language with that knowledge? Uh, not much at the beginning. One of the things that I realized most people wouldn't have done, and hence why Luke and I changed this with Mandarin Blueprint, is I just said to myself, I don't care that I'm not going to speak for a while. You know, I just said, I don't know, whatever. I'm just going to learn these characters because I need to. It's a long-term project. It doesn't really matter. Now, I think it ended up actually making me go faster and overall, kind of like you build up the foundational knowledge. And then when you reach that certain critical mass, your speed increases massively. But I just sort of accepted. I was like, I'm just going to learn these characters. And I recognize that I'm not going to be able to use them very well until I learned their pronunciations and then see them in context and all this stuff. Yeah. So I got those 1500 and they were just kind of in my head, you know, like it's like I could recognize mm -hmm. them. I could do an Anki card with them. Uh, and then eventually I took those 1500 characters and just made Anki cards with their pronunciations and just tried to force them into my head, which, you know, was kind of effective, but you know, you know, it's just rote learning essentially. So it didn't, at least yeah. it was with space repetition software, but it was still just like, just remember that this is die, die, die. You know, like it's like kind of that type of thing, yeah. right? I, I want to just talk about this a little bit because, sure. I, you know, there's people out there that do this. And, and there's people who really apply this as a learning strategy. But from what I'm getting from you, you did it, but you weren't able to really do much with the language at that point. Right. Yeah, because there's no there was no pronunciation as a part of it. And I mean... That makes yeah. it really hard. <laughs> you can't like pick up a text yeah. and, you know, sure, you could try to, you could look at a text and say to yourself, okay, I guess I understand sort of what this means, maybe a little bit, but without the sound adding to what can sort of make the memory when you're reading, being able to audiate or actually speak out loud what you're reading, it, it's a huge handicap. So, you know, it was between the first and second book that I learned about pronunciation mnemonics, and that changed the game. It's interesting because John brought to my attention the research paper in linguistics. It was essentially saying that learning words without pronunciation is not an effective, effective way to build fluency. Right. So it was essentially that in order for us to really retain a meaning of the word in our minds, we not need to just understand the meaning. The meaning you're learning is in English, yeah. not in Chinese, yeah. right? So that's not helping you to learn Chinese, process the language in your brain. So it's like you need to have that pronunciation attached with it. Right. I think it's interesting yeah. to hear your story kind of validating that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so it was just an inefficient route. It's not like the stuff that I learned didn't end up coming to fruition at some point once I learned yeah, the absolutely, pronunciation. But absolutely. It was definitely not the most direct route to, to fluency. But certainly I would say, though, I don't regret taking characters very seriously as a general principle, but the method by which I did it, I would have changed if I could have done it again. Tell us now, what, you, what did you start doing different and how did that impact your language skills? The, so I, I really had a good understanding of how Anki worked by that point. So I would take the content from what I was learning at university and I would make flashcards out of it. And then 
I continued with the second book. And in the second book, I applied a pronunciation mnemonic system to it as well, which um, was originally derived from a great guy named uh, Sergei Gorodish, who runs a blog called Country of the Blind. I, I know a book by that name. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. So he had a blog post called The Maryland Method. It was just about how to apply pronunciation mnemonics to the Heisig book. Define mnemonics for our listeners. Yeah. So, I mean, you could think of it as um, just visualization using your imagination. So, you know, anybody could do it. You could just uh, close your eyes and imagine yourself in your childhood home. Which room are you in? How about your bedroom? How about standing there is Bill Murray or Brad Pitt standing there in the room that you can map things onto that. So you can say your childhood bedroom represents third tone. And even better, let's say your current apartment that you're sitting in right now, the bedroom of that, how about we assign that to the pinion final ANG, and then Brad Pitt sitting in the bedroom. So we know it's third tone, bang. And then great. So we have B-A-N-G third tone, and it didn't take anything to think of that, if I say, imagine your bedroom or your current apartment, done. Imagine Brad Pitt standing there, done. It's so fast. And it takes advantage of our evolutionarily inherited skills of 3D spatial imaging. How the heck do I know where I am in space? How do I know where the ceiling is compared to my head and the, the walls? And then facial recognition, which we're obviously really good at, because if we weren't good at that in our evolutionary history, we would have not lasted very long. And then also object recognition, which is that's where the character components come in. So they character components are like just things. You know, I say my tumbler represents the component for just a vertical line. So yeah, so you just apply all these things, you map them on. And the reason you do this is because writing on a page we're not evolutionarily adapted for. We're not adapted to remember like a paragraph of text it takes forever. I don't know if you've ever tried to do that, but like you just try to memorize a paragraph of text with no, nothing else other than just looking at it. It's really hard, right? Mnemonics just make it way easier because you're taking advantage of what we're already naturally good at. So basically you're taking you know, existing visualizations and you're associating them with different sounds. Yep, but sounds and character components and meanings. And so how did that impact you? So, okay, so this is back to your story then. So you yeah. you did this. What happened next? Well, first of all, this got me really excited. It was super motivating because I was starting to learn characters really quickly. I could learn a character, and I'm talking like how to write it, how to pronounce it with the right tone and what it means in like less than 30 seconds a lot of times. Sometimes I'd get caught up on one and I wasn't sure and it might take me a few minutes. But generally speaking, it was very game theory. Like I was like, oh, I'm at 2000 characters now. Oh, I'm at 2040 characters after today. And, you know, I would get really motivated that way. So sort of success breeding success. What started to happen after that was, you know, I was taking the content from Sichuan University, putting it into my flashcards. And then I discovered closed delete flashcards. So sentences with like a missing character or two. And that's the purpose of the flashcards to determine what the character is. And, you know, they'd have audio or whatever from like text to speech software. I just started to realize I was like, oh, I'm going to succeed. You know what I mean? I'm going to just keep going. And once you feel that, I don't think anybody would stop. Right. Because it's like, of course, you want to be able to speak Mandarin. So that was sort of the thing that happened was I realized, OK, I'm learning these characters really quickly. And I'm starting to see them in words and I'm starting to see them in sentences and reviewing them. And because space repetition software is so awesome, I'm remembering everything. So I just sort of kept feeding into the system. And that's what sort of became self-perpetuating at that point. It was easy to stay motivated because I had the accountability of school, but I just didn't listen to them at all. <laughs> I just like was like, I mean, I listened to the content, but I didn't like review the way they suggested I review. I did it my own way. Then I decided after one semester there doing just the language program, I discovered, oh, if I pass the HSK four before the uh, next semester, I could get a degree in three years as opposed to four years. Like that's the, the deal they had. I was pretty confident I could do it. Uh, I had been studying for about a year at that point and I did and it was actually pretty easy. I passed the HSK four and decided, okay, now I'm going to do the degree. I just, I remember I made a decision at that point. I was like, study every day for at least five years. And uh, I did. So like it was sort of self-perpetuating in that way. 
what else did you do? Because I mean, learning characters, flashcards, and just learning the meanings and stuff—that's that's only one piece of the puzzle. How did sure, you, what else yeah. did you do in order to build your fluency and build your proficiency in the language? If I could have, uh, you know, redone it, I would have spent a little bit less time on the sentence level. So, like, I had hundreds and thousands and thousands of flashcards that were just individual sentences with like a character or two missing, and I kind of, I guess, I just sort of lacked the creativity to think that, hey, grammar is more than just sentences, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's mm -hmm. a paragraphs or a chapter of a story or a whole story, you know, as I'm sure you're well aware uh, with the Mandarin Companion book. So, because it's just, there's so much more context that it could give you. So eventually, though, I kind of started to figure it out. I was like, I need to have sentences that are related to each other <laughs> as opposed more to these context. flashcards that are coming. Yeah, it's like the, the context was was lacking. And so I did what everybody should do and bought the Chinese version of my favorite childhood book, which like a lot of people was the Harry Potter series. Oh, and okay, so yeah. I started reading Harry Potter and I'm sure that it was not at the extensive reading level at that point. Yeah, I, I've cracked that. There's a lot of hard words in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot of, I think, uh, alliterations, you know, not alliterations, but, you know, loan words, you know. Or, uh, exactly, exactly. Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah. The thing about that, though, is that, as I'm sure that you've thought about a lot, and Stephen Krashen talks about this as well, that if you really, really like the content, if the content speaks to you, you can tolerate not having less than 98% comprehension like he was talking about how when he was learning russian he was reading star trek because he loves star trek and it was he said he was about 60 percent comprehension but he just didn't care because he loved the content and so that was a big moment for me to realize oh yeah if i start reading this content where even if i don't totally get the actual language i remember this part of the book so i can kind of put it together and your brain can attach because the only way you can learn things is if you attach it to what you already know and so i already know this story like the raw story sans language like you know if you were to somehow imagine it in your mind and that's what you're doing when you're reading by the way we were talking about mnemonics earlier and visualization when you're reading a book that's what you're doing always but anyway so i was reading those books and that was just so gratifying that i quickly moved on to i mean it was probably several months in between, but I, I relatively quickly moved on to reading A Song of Ice and Fire, which was a big step up. It's way oh. harder, way harder than uh, Harry Potter. I had a lot more. The Game of Thrones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Game of Thrones. But I put the text into Link, link.com, which is Steve Kaufman's site. And so I put the text into Link. So it was really easy to just click all the weird words that had been translated from George R. R. Martin's work and be like, oh, what, what the heck's that? Oh, it's a you know, some medieval weapon. <laughs> no wonder I don't know it, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> but that was fun too, because again, I'd read it before in English. And so I knew the story. And of course I knew the TV show. So that made it easier too. you know, because I focused so much on characters and had this foundation of 3000 characters that I knew the meaning, pronunciation and writing, you're, you're never that far from acquiring a word. It's just a matter of like, oh, you haven't seen these two characters put together before. But most of the time, it makes sense. Compound words in Chinese aren't that complicated. Yeah, and that's another kind of breakthrough that I had was the recognition that because they decided, oh, I don't know, that, it's not like it was a conscious decision, but because Chinese, instead of having an alphabet, has this sort of like bucket of meanings called characters, it means that so many words, like I, I'm sure you've probably done this before, you guess what something is probably called, and it turns out you're right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, refrigerator. I guess that's a, I don't know, a bing xiang probably. Like, and then it's, oh, yeah, it is. Like, it's like it ice is box. an ice box, hey. right? You know? <laughs> and so that type of thing would happen. And that is so exciting, I feel, because mm. you realize, oh my gosh, this language is so good at profound simplicity. Like, you're just like, how can you get such a profound idea into two characters? On that note, my favorite one is, uh, well, actually, it's John's favorite, and it's my favorite too, is Dai Shu. Uh, kangaroo or the bag rat <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a good one i like in, in china's infinite permutations you know can be combined oh, yeah. in so many different ways another one was um uh, bao yuan, uh the the word for complain which yeah literally murmur. literally literally means to hug or harbor resentment and i was like that is what complaining is 
oh my gosh like it's like that when i'm because i mean if you say i'm complaining right now you know you might feel like oh it's not really good to complain but if you say i'm harboring resentment right now you're like oh i better take care of this i don't want to do that right it's like it's kind of like a self-help book in a word and i'm like that's amazing so you know it's, yeah. that, that type of stuff happens all the time in order to get to that level you need to have enough knowledge uh, and I think this is something, too, because I, I, one thing I've seen is sometimes teachers, they'll try to teach us at the very beginning. But until you have enough, as you said earlier on, critical mass, it's hard to do this. But once you get that critical mass, then it can snowball. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do think that all those sentence flashcards had an effect. It was just too long at that phase. You know, if I could have redone it, I would have done it much more like we designed our course, which is that the sentences, there's a time for it, which is when you know a few words, right? Like it's like you've learned a few words and you can put them together to create grammatically correct sentences and even better if they're frequent, right? Like they're the type of sentences that people will say a lot. And then once you've gained enough characters and words that you can put together paragraphs, do it, put together the paragraph, you know, like get, get to that point, which is why I love what you guys do with Mandarin Companion and any graded readers really, because it's like, the more context you have, the more potential connections to what you already know. Somewhere in that paragraph is going to be things you already know, which allows you to expand your knowledge. Relatively speaking, as soon as you can move on from basic characters, move into compound words. And then once you move into compound words, move into full sentences. And then when you're ready, go into paragraphs and then dialogues and then just build in the natural progression. And so... I kind of spent way too much time on the sentence level. Uh, Luke, my business partner, spent too much time in the vocab level. He like was on Memrise and just memorized loads of uh, individual vocabulary words. And he was like, he explains, he's like, they were just tossing around my head, but I didn't know how to use any of them. Eventually, once I got into reading more, uh, and then I started listening to uh, Luo Ji Si Wei. Oh, there's a whole other aspect to this I didn't mention, which is that I'm very, I'm a huge fan of Katsumoto from all Mm -hmm. Japanese all the time. Uh, I had Chinese on as much as possible, like immersion Chinese. And for the longest time, it didn't make any sense to me. But eventually, it's like you pick out a little thing. I always say to people, if you can recognize a first tone, or you can recognize, you know, one of those difficult to say, like, or you can get a word, hey, that's a that's a little win. You got a little win there. And you're not going to get that win unless it's on. It needs to be on and available. Like, I love the line from Katsumoto. If you open your eyes and you don't see, you know, he would have said Japanese, but let's just use Chinese. If you open your eyes and you don't see Chinese, you can improve your environment. If you open your ears and you don't hear Chinese, you can improve your environment. And it's all about increasing the likelihood that you're going to come into contact with, uh, with Chinese. And so I took that very seriously the whole time. And that's kind of, that's just one of those things that's sort of underlying in the whole process. It's not like I'm necessarily thinking about it all that hard every day, but it was there. And so I'm sure that that had a huge effect as well. What I like hearing about your story here is that you learned Chinese in a specific way. And I always Mm -hmm. say this is that there's a lot of ways to learn a language and they all can work. It's just some are more effective than others. Oh yeah. Yeah. And sometimes when I talk to people, we can have that uh, maybe a confirmation bias, like, oh, this is the way I learned. Therefore, this is the right way to learn. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. but, but I think, you know, in talking to you, it's kind of like, Hey, you know, we did this and it wasn't necessarily the best way. And it did work, right? A lot of these things you did, did work, but you found later on, oh, maybe this would have been more effective. And uh, I should have maybe changed my strategy a little bit here and there. Yeah. Well, I mean, here's an interesting phenomenon about the way I did it was that Uh, Both Luke and I actually, and we started studying Chinese coincidentally around the same time. We met after we had both started to learn Chinese, but we both sat the HSK 6 on the same day, and it was uh, January of 2016. I started studying in December of 2013, so we're just like a little over two years of study. And here's why it's a weird phenomenon. I passed the test, but I felt like, how did I pass this test? Like, I'm not very good at speaking, you know? So it was kind Mm -hmm. of one of those things where I was like, my reading and writing are so much better than my speaking. And I mean, part of that was what I told you at the beginning. I accepted you're not going to be able to speak for a while uh, if you take this approach of learning characters without the pronunciation. It's always been that way my whole journey. It's been like reading and writing way out ahead of my, uh, well, now my listening is pretty good, but like still, nonetheless, though, speaking has always been my lagging behind bit, but I've never minded because 
I like reading the most. That's my favorite thing. Now, this is something I'd like to hear from you. So what advice would you give to someone who's learning Chinese right now? And especially if they're not, don't have that opportunity to be in China. Because I mean, a lot of our guests here, they've spent time in China, but most people, they don't have that opportunity to go to China and really be immersed in the language. So what advice would you give to someone learning right now? Yeah. So uh, obviously, you know, it depends on your level. So let's just start from the perspective of a beginner. Pronunciation and characters are the hardest parts of the language, in my opinion. They're the parts that make people quit because they're the first steps. About half of the pronunciations, or like 500 of them or so, involve a tongue position or a mouth position that you don't use in English. So it's like it requires kind of going to the gym for your mouth muscles. You got to really practice it, but it's, it'll be well worth it if you do that right at the beginning. And then the second thing is don't wait to start learning characters as soon as you're ready because they are the foundation that is going to build you up to, to reading. And then I don't buy into this idea that Chinese doesn't have grammar. It does have grammar. It's just that it's not that hard because there's not form changes. There's not word form changes like good, better, best, that type of thing. And then secondly is be prepared mentally for a longer foundation building period than other languages might be. But know that it's kind of like a, a roller coaster. Like it takes a while to get to that top peak. But like once you get over that peak, your speed's going to increase and, you know, you'll go back up and down and you'll have your your ups and downs as you go, but it'll never be as long as that initial climb. So I would highly recommend just taking pronunciation and character seriously. There's obviously loads of other advice I would give, but that's like the main thing for a beginner. And then if you're at an intermediate level, read, 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 read as much as possible. And the best thing to do is do extensive reading, 98% comprehension or more. And so that's why I've always loved what you guys do. And you know, I like Chairman's Bow and Do Chinese. And like, I love all that stuff and what Steve Kaufman does at Link because it's all surrounding that idea of, okay, your level somewhere, where's your level? Okay, here's the 98% comprehension at your level. You know, in fact, we actually had Steve Kaufman. Uh, we interviewed him for a show. Oh, wow. So Phil, thanks so much for being on our show here. Also, just tell us real quick your website and where we can find you guys. Yeah, uh, mandarinblueprint.com. We're particularly good for beginners. And uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's all Mandarin Blueprint. It, essentially, it's an online video course. It's a one course that covers pronunciation, radicals, characters, vocabulary into grammar. And interestingly enough, right around where our course at the moment kind of um, finishes the content is the perfect time to start using graded readers. It like would, you know, it wraps perfectly into the stuff that you guys are doing. If you're looking for foundational sort of knowledge about Chinese, mandarinblueprint.com is the, a good place to go. Well, excellent. All right. So if you're learning Chinese, that's a great place to be. You have been listening to the You Can Learn Chinese podcast. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends, classmate, teacher, cousin, accountant, driver, tailor, hairdresser, butcher, and that one guy named Andrew. You can subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please, write us a review so we know how we're doing. You can find us on Facebook and at mandarincompanion.com. Apologies to John Cena, we ran out of time. The You Can Learn Chinese podcast is produced by myself, yep, just me, Jared Turner. I'd like to thank Phil Crimmins and my co-host, the man, the myth, the legend, John Pazden. See you next time.